This is lecture number 33. And this particular section of the series of lectures is about prophets, the nature of a prophet, how Confucius, Buddha, Muhammad, Socrates, and Jesus all fit these patterns of the way of life of a prophet. So this is part of the lecture series about creating an international sustainable civilization. So I think it's important to, um, uh, uh, religious pluralism is definitely a part of that. That's why Panchasila is was the main focus when I originally created this series of lectures. Um, and I linked it together with Panchasila number two, humanism. Um, and this particular lecture is about Jesus and Jesus as a prophet. Um, this is the tradition I was raised in. So, of course, it's harder to see yourself. And um, I hope it comes across as fair. Um, I don't think, you know, I favor it in any way. I think I've learned to appreciate every tradition equally. And um, I do like the Sermon on the Mount, but I like Gandhi liked the Sermon on the Mount, but he went back to his Hinduism uh, because he just thought, you know, Christians should be good Christians and Hindus should be good Hindus. That's what's important. If everyone were faithful to their tradition, we'd all get along just fine. And we could all educate each other in the, the real lessons, the way of life that is foundational for each tradition, which is what we really want to get to. Um, so Jesus' birth and childhood are analogous to Buddha. It's very interesting. Um, and other spiritual leaders, there are stories told about them. So in Jesus' case, before he was born, the angel Gabriel told Mary, oh, excuse me. she was pregnant by the Holy Spirit and her son would be a spiritual leader. While pregnant, she and her husband, Joseph, had to travel to Bethlehem but because he had to register his name in his hometown. When they got there, there were no rooms available, so she gave birth in a stable with the animals. Um, in Buddha's case, Buddha was the son of a king, but his mother had to go to her hometown to register, which is interesting. It was the woman's hometown, and on the way there, she gave birth under a tree. So, you know, here it is, a young prince. He was born under a tree. So the idea is that the privilege and the wealth have nothing to do with wisdom. Um, in Jesus' case, angels told shepherds to go and worship him. Wise men followed a star in the sky above the manger. Um, Jesus' childhood at age 12, while on a religious pilgrimage, Jesus left his parents to go to the temple and talk to the rabbis about the holy book, about God, etc. They were amazed at his insights. His parents forgot about the prophecy and were angry at him. So just like uh, Buddha's parents were told, your, your son is either going to be a great political leader or a great spiritual leader. And so their parents wanted him to be a political leader. So they exposed him to all sorts of pleasures so that he would get hooked on um, sensation, pleasure, wealth, and he would want to have power. But it didn't work. <laughs> and Jesus' parents, obviously they wanted him to be normal, I guess, and they should have figured and Jesus said that, you know, didn't you know this? And that should have reminded them, oh, yeah, the angel Gabriel. Oh, yeah, the Immaculate Conception. Huh, this is starting to play out. <laughs> but nope, you know. So in his late 20s, he was baptized by his cousin John. And the Holy Spirit descended and God's voice said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. He then went into the wilderness to meditate. So this is where it's very similar to Buddha. Buddha left home. He, he saw the four passing sites. He saw a monk meditating and he said, that's what I want. 
And so he left home secretly at night. He wanted to achieve liberation. And um, Jesus was baptized about the same age, actually his late 20s. Um, Jesus was baptized and had this experience, um, which experience of the holy, which Muhammad also had. Uh, Buddha, uh, Confucius must have had it because he made a decision to go on the great track. And lots of people have that kind of experience, actually. Um, that's my my kids figured out in their late twenties what they wanted. Um, so he went into the wilderness and he was hungry, just like Buddha sat down under a tree, and he was hungry. After forty days, he was returning to the city when he was tempted by the devil. So again, these temptations are very similar to Buddha at least the first two. Um, they're based on the human condition, especially pleasure and fear. Each man was trying to transcend physical desires and those two um, primitive drives, survival drives. They want to live for the sake of spiritual life, not survival. So they have to overcome that. And um, the first temptation is he was hungry and the tempter said, if you're the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And so the temptation to sell out for food, Jesus said, no, people do not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. So he gave up hunger, right? He's not going to sell out to hunger or material desires. The second temptation, devil took him to the top of a temple set. If you are the son of God, throw yourself down. Jesus said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. So living a spiritual life does not mean um, testing God. So I've had students who say that some students um, go drinking, um, carousing around, and then they take risks. Maybe they'll drive drunk and they'll say, well, if God wants me to die, I'll die. And if not, not. So basically, <laughs> they're testing God or they're um, acting in ways that are uh, irresponsible, right? Jump off uh, the top of a temple and, and want God to save them or go drive drunk and want God to save them. It's just, uh, yes, that's wrong to tempt God. You, the, you can figure out the virtuous life. You can live a good life, and it doesn't involve tempting God. Because it doesn't involve doing anything irrational. Um, and then you shouldn't question God's love or concern for humanity. Right? But we live our lives in love with God and our fellow human beings. We don't tempt to God. We don't violate traditional virtues and see if God still has an interest in us. Um, then the devil took him to a spot overlooking the world and said, you can rule all of this if you bow down and worship me. Jesus said, worship the Lord and serve him only. So uh, these serious, when a child comes of age and realizes he's really serious about living a good life, there's also the realization that you can have power over other people and you can have the power to manipulate them and gain political power, any kind of power you want. And then, or you can guide them toward a spiritual life. So, Jesus and Buddha both made the same choice. That's why they're the icons that we have. Uh, but that can happen to a lot of people. There are a lot of people who can realize that they're charismatic, that they get, you know, hordes of people will come and listen to them. And then they can decide, well, what do I want to do with that? Um, uh, so... I would, you know, my thought is that Donald Trump knows he can get a lot of people to believe in him, right? To give him power, even though he doesn't care about them. 
And that's the power he has. And so he is clearly a corrupt kind of leader. He's serious about his corruption and about amassing power. Whereas the religious icons are serious. They can grab attention and lead people toward the spiritual life. Socrates had it out, had to compete with the sophists. The sophists wanted to use their powers of persuasion to gain money and fame. Whereas Jesus tried to use rhetoric, he used a lot of the same techniques to try and get his students to love wisdom, justice, and virtue. Um, then Jesus called his first disciples. So Confucius had his disciples or his friends. This goes back to Aristotle's view of friendship and the highest form of friendship. They're, they have a common mind and a common idea of the good. Um, let's see. So uh, Jesus, I mean, Confucius, Buddha, he started a monastery. So they all had, you know, friends or people who recognized them, people who came and um, followed them in their spiritual journey in the legacy, the way of life, and what they wanted to leave behind. So Jesus asked people to repent, to purify their hearts. He healed the sick physically and spiritually. At the very beginning of his sermon, the sermon was about the same theme every kind of spiritual tradition is about, the common foundation, the rejection of, of the preoccupations and value of the things of this world, money, pleasure, power, and fame, and replacing those with spiritual, a spiritual life, a life driven by higher values. Okay, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those that mourn, for they shall be comforted. So what's true in this world is the opposite of the spiritual world. And we can live that out in this life. We don't have to believe it is true of some other life. Well, in this world, bad guys win and good guys lose. It's not true. He wants them to turn around, purify their hearts, and then he wants to change things. He wants to bring about change, just like Martin Luther King. He wants to purify or redeem uh, Judaism because it's become too corrupt. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And that to me is uh, seeing the intuition, kind of like Buddhism has a third eye and the Greeks have, uh, Plato uses seeing language. You can see things with your mind that you can't see with your senses or um, Hestia sheds light, the light of the mind. Hermes brings the light and um, somebody is bright. Somebody can see things other people can't. And it's all because of their mental, their purity of heart and their attuneness, their alertness to um, an idea of the good and what would be best in a given situation. So if you're pure in heart, you can, you can have an intuition about what's best. And you can realize that you're imitating the universe when you do that. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Great is your reward in heaven. And so there really are disagreements over which people are being persecuted, insulted, and are doing what Jesus wants. And there are people on both sides of the political divide, both sides of every social network that really think they are being insulted and persecuted because they, um, they represent what God wants. Martin Luther King, the people who disagreed with him claimed to be Christians. 
there's white nationalist Christian, you know? So we just have to, we can't, we can just start there, but then we have to keep examining, re-examining. We have to keep giving reasons for why one position is better than the other. And better really means what God wants as far as we know, which isn't very far. So claiming to know what God wants is pretty arrogant. So claiming that a certain thing is best as far as you know is basically as close as you can get <laughs> to what God wants without, you should never claim to think you know that. It's not knowable. You are the light of the world. Let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify God. So living um, the life of the mind, the mind is light in the Greeks. Um, so this is the same imagery. And Jesus knew about the Greeks and Greek philosophy. It was, had, uh, you know, the tradition had already existed for three, four centuries or more. Yeah, actually, seven centuries, eight centuries. So um, he, it's, it would be no surprise that he used some of those same images. They're poetical, they're metaphorical, they're allegorical. Um, it's also in Buddhism, which there wasn't, you know, there's not too much reason to think there was that, that Buddhist traditions had spread all the way to Israel. It doesn't really matter. It's just physiologically, I'm sure you can now do brain chemistry studies and say that when, you know, when these chemicals are in the brain, serotonin, or whatever, uh, people sort of light up, like that they look brighter. They, they are not so burdened, uh, whatever. Greek mythology, Hesti is the goddess of the hearth. On Mount Olympus, the gods and goddesses are sitting around the hearth, mostly arguing about justice, how to inspire human beings, what messages to send to human beings. And then the light of the mind lights up and is active. And then when the intuition comes, uh, Hermes takes that message and sends it down to earth. And that's when... You have tragedies where people think Zeus is telling them this. The thing about Hermes is he is both the messenger of gods and he's a trickster. And so people can think this is what God wants, but they got tricked by Hermes. And so the fact that Hermes is both the messenger and the trickster <laughs> means that everybody who thinks they're doing what they think the gods want has to explain it, they have to be accountable for what they think, because just because they think it's what the gods want, doesn't mean it is. And you can blame Hermes, but at the end of the day, you have to think critically, because you're accountable for whether you got tricked or not. <laughs> I think that's great. I think that kind of imagery and that kind of allegory and that kind of a, a mythological you know, personification of the human condition and of our minds is is really wonderful. I, I love it. Um, in human homes, the fire, when it comes down to human homes, the first it goes to the Hestia, to the heart, and the fire provides heat for warmth. This is what humans need. And for cooking, another thing humans need. While people are sitting and eating, they're engaged in deliberation about how to live. The light of their minds is activated. Um, okay, and then they go out from the home into the world. Just like uh, Hermes goes from the gods to earth, human beings are at the heart in the home, and they take that light and go out into the world. Do not think, and this is uh, really important, Jesus quotes from the Old Testament. So to me, this is just like, where Confucius says somebody can know 300 odes, like they can have memorized all the holy books, but they still don't know how to live. Um, so Jesus is saying this, that you can know the Torah, the 
uh, you can know the Old Testament, the religious law, all that, but you're still not living correctly. So he criticizes even what the laws say, the letter of the law versus the spirit of the law. So that's also true in um, Hinduism, Buddha's criticism of the Hindu. He says tradition, doctrine, all of that. The point is liberation. You don't need all of that. Um, Muhammad um, set up, actually kind of like Confucius, he set up deliberate tradition. There weren't any rituals and he wanted to set up a structured way to actually make the way of life that Jesus preached incarnated into a whole life. So, um, so just keep in mind that the essence of what Jesus was preaching is the essence of what Muhammad wanted to sort of create a set of rituals so that people could actually do that. When they're married, they have kids, they have jobs, they govern, they um, advise, they play out all those roles that Jesus couldn't because he died too soon. But uh, Islam, Muslims don't disagree with Jesus' basic way of life. Do not think I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great. Your righteousness, your way of life, your ergon, must surpass that of the Pharisees and teachers of the law. So the religious leaders who know the holy books are not righteous. It's righteousness, and people can be righteous without knowing the of God. It's a theme in all the prophets. You've heard it said, you shall not murder. One of the Ten Commandments, thou shall not kill. Anyone who murders shall be judged. But I tell you, anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Jesus wants purity of heart, or Jesus wants what the psychologist Psychologists would say internalizing the virtues. Or what Aristotle would say, Jesus wants people to uh, take pleasure in doing what's noble, as opposed to moral strength. Moral strength is where you don't really desire to do what's right, but you stick to it and you do it. Um, okay. So... Settle matter, matters quickly with your adversary and don't go to court. So again, this is similar to where Confucius says a good leader, when there are too many laws, it's a sign that people's characters are corrupted. People just disobey the laws. Um, what a good ruler really needs to do, and this shouldn't be just the, the king or the, you know, the one person on top. This is anybody with authority should be an inspiration. They should internalize things and they should rule mostly by example and they need to gain the trust and they need to have goodwill for people and they need to gain the trust through the force of their moral character. Um, otherwise, it's just a bunch of laws that will just make people, it'll, It'll even corrupt people's characters further. And that's what Aristotle said. He said, um, uh, a polis is an association between people bound together under a rule of laws where um, people think like citizens. And so the laws just function to help weave them together better and to institutionalize this quality of life so you can pass it on from generation to generation. But if people have weak characters or wicked characters, then the laws only function as tools to prevent people, wicked people from harming each other. And that is a polis at all. And so Jesus is saying that. He's saying, purify your heart, settle matters with your, with your fellow citizen, and don't make them another law or run to the law courts because it, then it's just a bludgeon, which is a problem in America. You've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. I tell you, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully 
has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye or another body part causes you to stumble, cut it out. Okay, I mean, this is purity of heart big time. Um, it's obvious that Americans <laughs> don't, you know, Gandhi knew what he was saying when he said, you know, this is a really good religion and Westerners should really try it. <laughs> Because, you know, Westerners are not pure in heart. They don't do what Jesus taught. Um, my students, of course, have some trouble with this. And so much corporate advertising is designed to feed lust. Because if you feed lust, people will buy all sorts of stuff to fix their bodies so they're more attractive to the members of the opposite sex so that people will lust after them. My gosh, you know, in the corporate world, in the economic world, lust is a major um, pleasure exploited to make money. Um, so obviously our culture is at war against nature. You know, we don't like our bodies. We want them to be artificially thin or whatever. And it's also, we, we make war against the spiritual traditions in the human spirit. And we should call it out. We should not call it Christian. You know, when people claim, you know, they're pro-capitalism and they're pro-America and they're Christian, they really need to think again. <laughs> it has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you, anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, makes her the victim of adultery. Anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. And so the point here I wanted to make is that 50% of Americans are divorced. And yet a huge percentage of them go to church. Now, are you going to be a legalist? and not allow them to come to church, technically, right? If, you know, if the woman was unfaithful, and I don't know why, right, this is very sexist, and the man decides to divorce, and he can only do it for this reason. It's not as if, what about the man's infidelity, and what about the woman making a decision? But, okay, <laughs> another issue, how literal are you going to make it? So how literally do you want to take the Bible? This is, there are many examples of people who call themselves Christian. Do not follow the letter of the law. And Jesus basically, in general, doesn't want them to. Um, and I'll give an example in a minute. But okay, so if we try to say that people from this denomination are morally better or people who are Christians are morally better. It's just, you can call people out on that a lot because they don't follow it. Even Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, which is sort of the, the central mission statement. And so you have to decide. I mean, personally, I think if people, if someone's married to someone that has no interest in being faithful, either sexually or spiritually they don't love the partner uh it seems to, it seems to me it's okay because marriage is a relationship if and it's based on love and if you marry someone that you think loves you and they don't um i to me i don't have any problem with divorce on those grounds because you're walking around giving the impression that you're truly married in what marriage really is for better, for worse and all that. And it's not true. So you're living a lie, but that's up to people to make decisions about. It's just that very few people follow literally what Jesus said. You have heard it said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I say, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. Give to those who ask you and allow others to borrow from. So 
uh, this, you know, just a very short and sweet comment is that at the time when the Bible says an eye for an eye, um, that was an improvement. That was a better, a more just command than what had happened before. What happened before was that if someone hurts somebody else or their relatives, you were justified in taking revenge that was way more than what had been done to you, okay? Somebody pokes out your eye, maybe even unintentionally. You can kill them, revenge is sweet. So you make your own decisions about what's appropriate revenge. Of course, that triggers uh, a desire to revenge back. So there's a spiral downward. So this particular teaching, preaching, was trying to stop the cycle of vengeance, right? You take someone's eye, uh, they can take your eye and level it off. No more revenge. Stop the cycle. Um, but Jesus goes further, right? Um, purity of heart. You forgive people. You move on. Um, another thing about slapping you on the cheek is that actually in the context, turning the other cheek is an insult. I read an article about that, which is fine. Scholars bring up stuff like that. But if anyone wants to sue you, take your shirt, hand over your coat. So just the idea that you don't want to create animosity unnecessarily. So I would associate this with the virtue of sociability in Aristotle. It It's some level of it is just necessary for practical wisdom. Of course, Jesus, uh, agape, or the love of God and Christian charity goes way beyond the demands of practical wisdom. But it's consistent with the demands of practical wisdom. Uh, give to the one who asks you, allow others to borrow from you. So um, certainly you can't make a system of laws based on it's it's legal for you, you know, to take someone's shirt and um, it's, you know, there's no legal recourse. You should, I mean, you can't behave this way and have a legal system. It goes way beyond the demands of the legal system, but that's the kind of quality of life that makes it possible to have laws that keep, keep promoting and weaving people together and motivating people to develop a higher quality of life. So the laws really function just as a way to sustain and pass on a very high quality of life. But you have to have purity of heart. You know, you have to do that. Okay, so. Um, all right. You have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. I, I mean, this is another way that, that Aristotle would say to have a polis to have a healthy society. You have to have trust and goodwill for each other. So, so you do have to overcome animosity. You have to forgive. You have to convey to other people that you do have their well-being in mind. So that's praying. For Jesus, you know, a monotheist, it's praying. For Aristotle, a monist, it's um, it's having goodwill, maintaining your idea of the good through it all, and having enemies, not letting go of the past, uh, maintaining bad will, right? Um, resentments, grudges, is uh, makes you lose your mind. Uh, so, in the um, the virtue of anger. You can have too much or too little. And there are people, he says, some people overreact, most people do, but some people underreact, but they hold a grudge. So that would be it, that you hold a grudge, you have this enemy. And um, so 
Aristotle says you should let that go so that you can have a mind, so you can actually have practical wisdom when you make decisions. You're not going to be biased based on old grudges. Uh, Jesus, it's the love of God. Uh, uh, forgive, forgiveness. Matthew chapter 6. When you give to the needy, give in secret. When you pray, pray in secret. God knows what's in your heart. When you fast, do not let others know. So these would be the traditional rituals, um, but traditionally they're done in public. And so Jesus changes that and says, do it in private. Don't, you know, show off. We don't need public rituals. We just need people that have purity of heart. And that will come out over time. People will know if you have that kind of character. You don't have to show off. Um, store up your treasures in heaven, not on earth. Don't worry about not only money on earth, but scoring any sort of points about being righteous. And the other issue is you cannot serve both God and mammon, money. So if you buy things you don't need, if you buy things that are clearly status symbols, if you buy things that are clearly self-indulgent, um, and if you buy things so that you can prove that you're better than somebody else because you're more successful than somebody else because you're richer than somebody else, that's it. You don't have a spiritual life. You don't have purity of heart. If you don't have purity of heart, you're not living the life of the spirit. You've decided to worship them. Um, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. Seek first the kingdom of heaven and these things will be given unto you. So, uh, so I mean, what that means isn't, gee, if I really am good, then I'm going to get rich. <laughs> um, I think what it means is if you do stop worrying and you stop being anxious um, and you really seek the kingdom of heaven, you will get what your spirit needs. And it might ne necessarily be money, you know? It's just that your spirit won't need it anymore. You'll, you'll figure out you don't need those material goods. You didn't need to be anxious because you really didn't need all that stuff that you thought you actually had to have. So I think that's what he means by, if you really um, stop worrying, what you do need will be given to you because you'll know what you really need. Don't judge others or you will be judged. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye and ignore the law in your own eye? This is hypocrisy. So, Aristotle would agree with this. You can't have practical wisdom and you can't have a microcosm in the macrocosm if you judge other people because you're only judging based on external behaviors. You don't know the quality of their heart. That has to be lived out in their whole life, in their character. So when we interact with people, there's very few people we know very well. That's why... Greek tragedy is about people who have bonds of affection with each other, usually family members or lifelong friends. Or in Plato's dialogues, it's fellow citizens because they do have to collectively govern the city. But in, in, uh, in general, the degree to which you are close to them and you know their character is the degree to which you can help or hurt each other. And if a person is out of balance, that uh, that uh, imbalance gets passed on to their children or it affects the family, immediate family, extended family. So it's important to seek wisdom, but you shouldn't judge others because everyone but the people whose characters you actually know well, you don't know. So when you're looking at behavior, you don't know what you're looking at because what you're looking at is somebody's mind. It can't be separated from their philosophy, their worldview, why they're doing what they're doing. And the immediate why, but the broader why. I'm doing this because my brother did that. 
and I'm and my and I think that this is the just thing to do. This is what's right. This is what's virtuous. And how do you get that idea? Because that's how my parents told me. That's what my preacher. It's all connected. And unless you can see the big picture driving this person, sometimes they're not even conscious of the big picture, especially not if they're reacting in some sort of quick, immediate way. They depend on their overall character and its formation. Uh, thoughts that aren't necessarily conscious even at the moment or even, you know, people have not become conscious of what's really driving them and the patterns and belief systems behind what they are. And um, so it's silly to judge others. And also, why do you look at other people's flaws without looking at your own? So you should know that you know, you know your own flaws, you know your impurities of heart, you know you have a lot of impurities, you made a lot of mistakes. And so all when you encounter somebody else, you don't really know. That might be just a slight uh, a decision they had to make in the circumstances that's really not an expression of their character. On the other hand, it might be um, only one of the wicked things they do and a lot less wicked than what they really do when they really get a chance. But you you have no idea, you know? All you have an idea, and this is what Socrates does too. I worry more about myself. I don't worry so much about other people. I don't worry about trying to explain away these things. I worry about myself, what kind of person I am, who am I? I examine myself, I examine other people. When I see a flaw in other people, I look and see if I have it in myself. Um, so Socrates says this, Jesus says this, um, Confucius criticizes his, his disciples uh, for judging each other. And I mean, the same stuff keeps coming up. I'm sure there's a quote in the Quran Buddha, right? The point is liberation. Don't judge other people. Don't, you know, he would definitely be against all of that. Um, ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. In everything, do unto others what you would have them do to you. This sums up the law and the prophets. So, of course, the golden rule, uh, Confucius had the negative golden rule. Every one of those icons um, does to others what they would want done to them or and doesn't do to others what they wouldn't want. And they take pleasure in that. And it's a whole way of life. It goes way beyond just the golden rule. It's going over and above what you need to do. It's um, extending your hand, right? Forgiving. And then when it says, ask and it will be given, seek and you will find the real key there is if you're living a really spiritual life, you know what to ask. And when you know what to ask, you'll find it. For example, you can't um, ask that your sister get over her grudge from 10 years ago. But, because you can't control that. But you can ask, well, how should I think about my sister? How should I think? Just ask and just leave it an open question. And usually if you really open your mind, you don't shut anything down. You don't say, I'm mad at my sister. Don't judge your sister. My sister doesn't do this. Frankly, my sister is really good about this. I don't know why I came up with that example, but family systems are crazy. Um, but if you just keep an open mind, and you um, hold the question, eventually something will probably come to you. You'll have some idea. Or you'll give up asking and it won't bother you anymore. Whatever it is, if you're able to live a spiritual life, when you ask and you know, keep asking, keep an open mind, eventually the spirit 
will speak or you will be able to integrate the issue into an authentic life of the spirit and a pure heart. So I think that's what it means. It definitely doesn't mean uh, <laughs> Janis Joplin had a song, Oh Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz <laughs> so I can keep up with my friends? You know, she's sort of mocking the materialism of American life. And it's true. It has separated us from any kind of meaningful spiritual life at a very profound level. Um, enter through the narrow gate. The wide gate leads to destruction. So Plato had the high road and the low road the cave and the path out of the cave. And the, it was the long and winding road through life versus the short and easy road, which is materialism. Um, every spiritual tradition has that distinction. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ferocious wolves. A good tree bears good fruit, a bad tree bears bad fruit. A person's way of life reveals their character over time. So I know in my country, the political polarization, the demonizing is terrible. And each side thinks the other side are false prophets. Um, they come in sheep's clothing. They have this rhetoric that says we're virtuous and they're wrong or we're Christians and they're degenerates um, and it's terrible because there's no way any of that is accurate because nobody knows the other people's heart and they don't know if the person has tragic good intentions or if they're really corrupt they don't know because they don't know people on the other side of this divide they don't know them well enough they don't know their character for the most part. Polarization is really unhealthy and, and it's not spiritual. And so all these spiritual traditions will, um, will condemn judging, you know, um, calling somebody you don't even know a false prophet, but saying in general, you think this particular claim to righteousness is not righteous for whatever reason, but that's different than, you know, demonizing another person. Many political leaders claim to follow God or Allah, but they're manipulating the public. These texts teach people to think critically. They do not ask for blind faith. Only politicians do. So these texts, you know, watch out for false prophet. Don't believe everything you hear. Uh, don't be a sucker for in religious issues. Be a critical thinker about religion. Somebody comes to you quoting the Bible, doesn't mean that they're pious or righteous. You can't have blind faith. Jesus doesn't want you to have blind faith. He says, build your life on my words, the rock, not on shifting sand. Materialism is shifting sand. Jesus and the six characteristics of religion. So we're back to this comparison between all the, all the prophets. Authority, the Sadducees and Pharisees claimed to control the spiritual life. Jesus rejected their claims and said the essence of the message is love God, love your neighbor, purify your heart. Ritual, Jesus baptized people, even though he was not an ordained rabbi. At age 12, he spoke to the rabbis with authority, undermining a traditional coming of age ritual and honoring, you know, assuming that the authorities had it all right. He, ch he changed water into wine at a wedding. Again, he disrupted the traditional ritual. Weddings are, of course, religious rituals etc. He's always upsetting the status quo. But so is Buddha. And so is Socrates. And so is Muhammad. Uh, speculation. The religious leaders have been given an elite education, the rabbis, and they claim to have elite knowledge. 
that justified their authority. Jesus rejected it. It's about love God, love your neighbor. Buddha, same thing. It's about liberation and the path to liberation. It's about suffering and the end of suffering. Tradition. For Buddha, it's the suffering that comes from being tied to mammon, right? Neither God or mammon. Suffering comes from desire, desiring things you can't control. And the release is to is to separate yourself from all of that. Focus on the Atman, the spirit inside of you. Tradition, the accumulated wisdom of the tradition. Jesus changed the way Judaism was practiced. Instead of praying in public, he wanted people to pray in secret, etc. Instead of giving alms in public, he would in secret, etc. He gave them the Lord's Prayer instead of the traditional prayers. Grace. He told people how they needed to live to have eternal life, but he focused on internalizing purity of heart in this life and living out that eternal life now. He didn't, didn't say, you'll always be miserable in this world. Just believe in the next world, right? He, he, didn't, he wanted to give people hope just by doing something you can do, which is purify your heart. Same with Buddha. You need... You know, he gave people hope by giving this, this method for how to basically purify their hearts and they'd be liberated. And that would make them hopeful, right? They, they hope they can relate to each other. They can uh, flourish in whatever context, whatever that means. But that's grace. And then mystery. Jesus was aware of a higher power. And he spoke for God and or in the name of that power, monism. So you can interpret Jesus' view of God. He might have been, I mean, he was raised in a monotheistic tradition, certainly. But he is very aware that his idea of God is very different from that of the rabbis. So it would make more sense to just say monism is what's true. And these, the rabbis... Pharisees and Jesus have a very different idea of what it means to live in uh, in sync with that divine power, that ultimate unmoved mover. People are different. They live out a spiritual life in different ways. So in Hinduism, there's four paths to God, uh, the path of reflection, the heart, action, and yoga. In Hinduism, um, also has the intellectual leaders, the administrators, the workers, and the untouchables. So they they sort of institutionalized that difference, and that had a corrupting influence because it got uh, it got solidified. The people were put in those positions not because of their spiritual calling but because who their parents were buddhism has two paths the monastery or public life confucius had the great going forth trying to be an advisor to leaders and an educator of future leaders so confucius calling was to be a scholar a teacher an advisor socrates was also an advisor to leaders and an educator of future leaders Aristotle distinguished between the life of practical wisdom and the life of the theoretical wisdom. So Aristotle himself uh, didn't, didn't exercise political authority, but he was an educator of future leaders. Um, Plato was an educator of future leaders and an advisor to... Uh, he was asked by... Uh, leader of a city state to educate his son so that the son would take over and be a philosophical leader and that failed horribly and plato barely got back with his life so but he did try and he did think his educational system would give him um, the tools to be able to advise leaders current leaders and to educate future leaders Islam also has intellectual leaders and teachers, my friends who are engaged in the interpretation and application of the Quran and other aspects of Islam. 
And then it has the people who go out in the world, the people that they have taught or the people that they, and they still can have insights to advise current leaders in any field. Okay. They're different, Paul says this. So the Bible, Paul, the New Testament, they're different gifts, but the same spirit. They're different kinds of service and kinds of working, but the same God works in them all. All of them are dedicated to the common good. To one is given the gift of wisdom, another knowledge, faith, healing, prophecy, overcoming religious intolerance, class differences. We were all baptized by one spirit into the body of Christ, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free. So, you know, Paul's already having trouble during the early church of people being religiously intolerant. Paul opened up the Jesus movement, um, the trigger, you know, what inspired people to carry on Jesus' story. Paul opened it up to Gentiles. Well, then the, there was religious intolerant. There were the Jews who didn't want Gentiles. And then the Gentiles maybe didn't like the Jews. I mean, already there are these animosities and Paul's getting so frustrated. And then slave or free, the early church was actually communist, socialist. They shared their material wealth, which makes total sense. If you're not going to worship mammon, you should, you know, definitely even out. Everybody should have the same standard of living. For Aristotle, it would be middle class. But anyway, so again, within the, the churches, the church at Corinth, there was animosity between the people who were slaves or originally slaves and people who were born free. <laughs> it's frustrating. Okay, today psychologists have created sophisticated personality tests to find out what kind of job would fit a person's personality. These are purely secular categories dedicated to help a person pursue their own good in this rational, calculating way, especially a job, not the common good or the spiritual life. So the modern enlightenment discipline of psychology was originally anti-religious. It's being replaced now with this notion of spirituality as having an integrated uh, psyche. So, um, so let's see what, oh yeah, I was going to say that even within the traditions, when they have this understanding of different spiritual callings, that really fits with monism better than it fits with monotheism, because people then will disagree. If it's a personal God, well, what did he say over here in Leviticus? What did he say over here in uh, Proverbs? What did he say over here in the New Testament? But if it's monism, then you do look for these patterns and you also acknowledge differences because monism should lead to pluralism. Different people with different gifts, but there's patterns in the nature of those gifts because of what people need to flourish. So there's some people who naturally gravitate toward relationships. And um, because people need healthy relationships and lots of different levels of their lives. People need each other in lots of ways. Children grow up within many different social networks. So they feel a calling to weave together people in various social networks, political institutions, creation of laws. We all need all these things. And so, and that's what monism will say. It's a basic patterns in human affairs inevitably leads to pluralism, pluralism in religious traditions, pluralism in social um, well-being, pluralism in, in what people, different people need in order to flourish. Um, but there's, but we can understand that because there is this underlying order. So that's, that's Jesus, <laughs> in a nutshell, I guess, as a prophet. 